69-year-old Benny King, and cops would find that he'd been stabbed 33 times. Damn! Was your son being capable of something? I don't know. Did you get some information about a homicide? Then I heard him and his mom arguing over the phone about it wasn't supposed to go that far. She decided to give up her own son and told the police the After address of his safe house. Walker, you mentioned that traffic. Okay, okay, okay. What's the vibes, YouTube? It's your boy Swaggy G coming at y'all with another reaction vid. Whether you just got out of work, your boss been tripping, asking you to do things that ain't really matching your pay rate, or you just got out of school and your teacher just been nagging you, giving you mad assignments for no reason, and your classmates coming in 8 in the morning, yelling, screaming, trying to fight each other. Chill, 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 bro. I'm already knowing. So I found a fire visit of the day. All I need you to do is sit back, relax, cock your feet up, and smash that like button, smash that subscribe button. Join the fam. It don't cost nothing to join the fam. Don't be petty. Smash that subscribe button, join the fam, and let's tap right into the video of the day. It all started on April 8th when Akron police received this phone call. Akron 911, what's the location of your emergency? Oh my god. What is happening? 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 Immediately, police rushed to the scene. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> you want to go hang out over there for us so you can have room to work here? Sit. The ground floor had been ransacked, but it was the scene upstairs that had terrified Sarah. Upstairs lay her good friend, 69-year-old Benny King, and cops would find that he'd been stabbed 33 times. Damn! <laughs> oh. 33 times? That's gotta be a hate crime, bro. That he'd been stabbed That's 33 personal. times. <laughs> oh. Where's his injuries at? Oh, I don't know. I, I have not touched him. I, all I did was touch him to see if he was stiff, but he's stiff and cold. So we're calling it obvious. Yeah, I'm not gonna move him. Initially, the cops had no idea what could have possibly happened to Benny, but as they explored the house more, a clear picture would slowly be painted of exactly what had happened. His bed was absolutely soaked in blood, and his walls were covered in it too. Police presumed that Benny had been attacked in his bedroom before he crawled into the hallway, begging for his life, where the killer finished the job. The majority of the cuts were to his head, neck, and upper body, but there were a few wounds on his hands as well, indicating that Benny had courageously tried to fight back. The police don't know this yet, but in just a few weeks, this exact scene would be found across town in an identical murder. For now, though, what police found in the kitchen was even more bizarre. Any idea, though? Can't find anything? I didn't dig around too much there. I'm really not going to. Well, because the, the lady you called said that all of his cabinets in the kitchen are open, and she checks on him on a regular basis and she's like, I don't know why that would be like, like that. By like someone who goes in here looking for something. Like, all the cabinets here are open. I mean, who does this? Oddly though, nothing seemed to have been displaced or stolen. Something very strange is going on. So the cops turned to the person that discovered Benny's body, Sarah Evans, who had some crucial information that would start to spiral this case into a complex mystery. Was it the back door that you found found open? No, the front door. When I come back from 11:30, this door was locked. Okay. And when, when I called you, when I come back up, the front door was unlocked. Okay, so you were here this morning at, 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 at 1130. 11.30, and you spoke to him then? No, I didn't see him then. I thought he lay, would lay down and take a nap from 3. And then you came back a little bit after 1, and that's when you found the, the yeah. door open? Yeah, it was unlocked. Okay. The back door is unlocked, too. 11.59. Does he usually keep, keep his doors locked? Yeah. 23, mode drive, break. So I said he locks it, he goes to take a nap, but as soon as he gets up in the morning, he unlocks it. Was the dog 
out when you, when you no, got here? No, the dog was in his chair. Okay. In his chair when I came in the door. And that's why I knew when I seen the stand over and the dog in the chair. Mm -hmm. Detectives then asked Sarah if she could think of anyone who had any issues with Benny. That's when she mentioned two brothers, Justin and Johnny, who were often seen visiting Benny. Sarah also told them that they had ongoing problems with Benny and were sometimes seen fighting with each other. In fact, their most recent argument resulted in Benny chasing them off his property with a shotgun. Justin also had problems with drugs and was always on the lookout for a way to make money fast. So it's rumored that he'd stolen something of Benny's and pawned it, causing all these arguments. The drug addiction, history of exploiting Benny, as well as the gun incident just days prior meant that police figured they finally had their suspects. But that's when Sarah mentioned a suspicious vehicle that had been spotted outside Benny's house right around the time of his death. That was up through here mm -hmm. earlier today, this morning, I guess. It sped away. They come time? back. I, I don't know it was earlier this morning. They come back. It sped away again. Uh, he said it was a, a younger white guy driving. Who said that? Uh, a guy. I can't tell you because he's in trouble. He's got warrants. You know okay. Know? Well, what's his warrants for? Is it, is I that... don't have no. I have okay. no idea. So I've done, I'm just giving you the information I was getting. Okay. This seems like vital information, but the only guy that saw it is quite literally on the run from the cops without stating warrants. So the officer tries to see if he can strike a deal. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. There's a, a detective coming, okay? I understand if you guys have has, has, has some warrants. Mm -hmm. um, if it's possible that we can guarantee we will not arrest him, not do anything, would, did you guys can go ask him if you want to talk to us then? Ordinarily, a fugitive would never agree to a deal like this, but because Benny was such a nice and respected guy in the neighborhood, he comes outside just a few seconds later to tell the cops everything he knows. How's it going, brother? I saw this goldish older style Hummer, big body Hummer. Mm -hmm. Speed away from over here. I don't like. I didn't hear no noises, like gunshots yeah. or anything. Okay. But it How was, about what time was? What was that? Uh, ten thirty, eleven ish. I was up here. Maybe twelve. I come up here. No, okay. no. It had to be like. I was up here at eleven thirty. Okay. It had to be about like ten thirty or something. Okay, so, so between 10, 30, 11, then I heard her screaming about something, then all this happened. Okay. Then she discovered that. I have not seen that vehicle. You've never seen that car around here, here or nothing? Did you, did you happen to see who was who was driving? A white male. Okay. Blondish, short hair. Like short. Kind of crew cut like yours. Okay. I, I would say anywhere from his mid 20s to early 30s. He sped around the corner so fast his tires were squealing. Okay. Like, what the hell? If the car had shown up around 12 that night, that's right in between Sarah's two visits to Benny's house, the exact window where Benny was murdered. And with how the car was allegedly driving, it really does seem as though this Hummer has something to do with Benny's murder. They just need to figure out who was inside. And conveniently, a neighbor overheard this conversation and told the police that he knows a man in the neighborhood that drives a Hummer exactly like the one described. Unfortunately, he doesn't know the guy's real name, only his nickname, Jaybird. You're just assuming Jaybird right. being yeah. connected to a Hummer. Correct. You don't know. Right, and I, I don't have any personal knowledge about that, but I know that I've seen him many a times with him. With the armor? Yeah, the armor. What color? Uh, roughly that color. Let me tell you. Dusty, dusty gold, like that. Uh, okay. So you've seen Jaybird driving this whole Before, armor. yeah. Okay. It sounded like this Jaybird was a prime suspect, but nobody on the scene right now was able to tell them his real name. But before they're able to figure it out, they're confronted with a fourth suspect, and it was the last person that anyone had expected. This is Benny's daughter, Patricia, and as soon as she showed up on the scene, she seemed to already have her mind made up about who the killer really was. Did you talk to bitch down there? <laughs> Let me say this friendly. That lady down there has been paying his bills. And she's been taking all his money and not paying on his bills. So the gas bill I have not yet wait, paid. Wait, 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 wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, shorty. 
You came here and you said she's been paying his bills. And then you say she's been taking his money. How does that make sense? Oh, it's a bitch down there. <laughs> Let me say this friendly. That lady down there has been paying his bills. Mm. And she's been taking all his money and not paying on his bills. So the gas bill oh, I have not yet paid. So she's giving her the money to pay the bills. So I don't have a bill to say because she's not giving him the bills. She's keeping them. She's for she is writing on the receipts what she is supposed to pay versus what she really paid. And this has been going on for over three months. So she's been working on for three months. He's never had a bill that he never paid in full until this lady down the street decided that she was going to help him. She took upon herself to help him. There we go. And that's her way to get her drug fix, is by taking his money. That's right. She's talking about Sarah. Apparently, since she's taken over paying Benny's bills, they've all either been late or underpaid. Patricia is certain that she's been stealing money from Benny this way. And in fact, she thinks she might have stolen even more, too. And his money's better still be in there, because I know exactly where it's at. Where? It's in a cabinet in this kitchen and a coffee cup. Mm -hmm. I come? Yeah. Usually. Yeah, the body's not in there no more. Um, I'll be right back out with you. Uh, whoever did this knows. Everything is starting to fall into place. It now makes sense why the cabinets were flung open. Whoever killed Benny was looking for money. And that's not even the biggest revelation the cops were about to have. Not even close. Currently, they have four suspects. And any one of them could be their killer. Each one of these could take days to interview and process. But with every hour that passes, the killer is getting closer to finding their next victim. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to take a guess that it's... Either Sarah or Johnny, because they're working hand in hand. They're like vouching for each other. They both saying some gold Hummer, Jaybird, like they're throwing off the scent. And that money, that that's with every hour that passes, right the killer is getting closer to finding their next victim. Who's this? Luckily, after talking to another neighbor, they were given some vital information that cut down their search just a little bit and sent them in the direction of one man in particular. They were able to discover that Justin, one of the suspected brothers from earlier, had a nickname, Jaybird. The money, the gun, the drugs, the Hummer, everything was lining up. And in the cops' minds, this could definitely be their killer. So to ensure they had all the information possible, they started interviewing his brother, Johnny, so that when they got around to Justin, they'd have no trouble getting him to confess. Oh, hell, probably afternoon, I took my dog over there uh -huh. so you could see him. Me and my wife did. I had her take dog round back. Then I brought the dog in for a couple minutes. He could pet it. He got pissed off about something. So he <coughs> what? Uh, what did he get pissed off about? He did. What did he get pissed? What because was he pissed that about? Little dog he's got. He don't like no other dogs. You know what I mean? Being around his little dog because he's afraid the dog's gonna eat him. Uh huh. Do you do you go over and see him quite often? Yep, sure do. Go over and drink a beer with him just about every day. Um, so you last saw him yesterday about 7.30 in the evening? Or? Yeah, what, what's this all about? He's dead. you got to be kidding me, dude. No, I'm not. Oh, oh my God. i got to go down there, dude. The cops figured this reaction to be genuine, and as they talked to him more, they became certain that Johnny didn't know anything about the crime. But that doesn't mean his brother is innocent. In fact, what Johnny is about to say actually makes the cops even more suspicious. Uh, who is Justin? Brother. Okay, when, would he have seen him later than you had? No, nope, he, he ain't been a lot around down there. If somebody said they saw him down there, that wouldn't be true? I don't know. I'm, I, when I go down there, my brother ain't there. 
Usually, Johnny and Justin would go and see Benny every morning at around sunset, and that's been the case for the last three years since his wife passed away. Johnny can't think of a reason for Justin to be down there so early, especially not on his own without telling him. Johnny was even able to provide some extra details about the disagreement they had recently, proving to the cops just how heated it had gotten between them. He told him, look, get away from my house, don't you ever come back again. He said, I've loaned you money four or five times on this bull junk stuff that you bring me. I'm on a fixed income here. I can't just keep <laughs> giving. He physically pushed him? Oh, yeah. yeah. By this point, the cops had already heard all they needed to hear. 19 hours later, they managed to track down Justin and would bring him in for interrogation. Justin was left in the interrogation room for around 45 minutes before the interrogation began. This is a tactic used, among many others, to make Justin feel as uncomfortable as possible. Hey Justin, you are arrested for those warrants we talked about. Um, you got four warrants on you. How do you know him? What is your relationship with him? Can you kind of take us through that? My brother, um, he was more or less like a stepfather, pretty much. How so? Sugar so stick man, giving you a dollar or a cigarette or something to eat or, you know what I mean? I lived next door to him there for four or five months. I had a warrant, which I went and did my time and got it all taken care of, you know what I mean? If you're asking, did I kill him? No, I did not seems rather straightforward from Justin's perspective. He had exactly the same nice things to say about Benny and doesn't seem stressed out or anxious about being here. He's leaning forwards towards the detective instead of instinctively pulling away. He's maintaining eye contact when he can and his tone seems deliberate and genuine. Everything about how he's presenting himself is relaxed, as though he's just trying to give the detectives what they need and get out of there. But unfortunately, just saying you didn't murder someone isn't enough for the cops, so they decide to confront him with the evidence they've gathered against him. Um, so we talked you know, to everybody in the neighborhood, except for the one person that they said he banned from the house. It was me. <laughs> so, yeah. Is that over money, or what was that about? Uh, yeah, it was over money, but uh, no, I was with my brother. At his house, my uncle told you he was drinking beer with. I had to take his okay. He told me, friend, it doesn't tell me. Sorry. You say anything about a shotgun? Yeah, he did. He told my brother, he's like, I should take my shotgun down there and pump a couple of the twins in his ass. He said, that brother is it. <laughs> he never had a problem giving me money or anything like that. I'd probably say it's a problem. He was a good guy. I, I cared for him as a dad. Justin was banned from the house and there was an argument over money. But it doesn't seem like he held that against Benny at all. But the detectives find this strange. All the signs pointed towards Justin being the killer. But now he seems like he had no issues with Benny at all? But they've still got their main piece of evidence, though. His Hummer was seen at Benny's house on the morning of the murder. That had to mean he was lying this whole time, right? Uh, you drove or used to drive a Hummer? A Hummer? You ever drive a Hummer in the neighborhood? <laughs> no. Did you ever work on a Hummer? You never had, no. I always had a fucking Hummer. <laughs> I go a lot. The way he's dressed and the way he looked. It don't even look like he really owned a car. And if he owned a car, it's got to, like, it, a Hummer's not fitting that guy. You know the gas mileage on there? He can't pay, he can't even pay for his drugs. Did you ever work on the Hummer? You never had, no, I always had that fucking Hummer. <laughs> <laughs> you know anybody that's, uh... No. If you watch any interrogation where a guilty suspect is confronted with a piece of valid evidence, their reaction is always very stiff and short. They try and deflect it immediately by saying no and explaining exactly why that could never be the case without showing a hint of emotion. Justin is an ex-convict that works various handyman jobs jumping from place to place. He doesn't need to explain why he doesn't own a $40,000 SUV. His facial expression when he's asked, alongside the way he laughs and jokes naturally about the concept, is enough to tell the detectives he was telling the truth. They still didn't want to discount him completely as a suspect, but they did figure that if he wasn't the killer, then he might at least be able to help them out. So they asked who he thought might have been responsible, and his answer was someone they were very familiar with. Sarah. 
Huge. She took things, bank cards to the bank, food stamps. That's what my brother was telling me on the phone the other day. Then he thinks that she might have had something to do with it. So if I point a finger, I'd probably check her for sure. Of course, he's talking about Sarah, and he's accusing her of exactly the same thing Patricia did earlier. And in fact, John had even mentioned this in his interview earlier that day, too. Anybody in that neighborhood or anybody have any problems with him or give him a rough yeah, time? Yeah, uh, what's called down the street. Dad. Who's that? Uh, I'm trying to think of her name. She lives down at the end of the road. She'd go over there, take his money for bills, go up to the corner store, and was supposed to pay on all his bills. Well, come to find out, she ain't been paying the full amount on your bills. She's been only paying the half. And I went over there one day. He said, after all I've done for that bitch. Did they reconcile at all or? No, he, uh, he said, look, you're a thief. Get the out of my house. Don't ever ask me for another dime. Quickly, the cops are starting to realize that Sarah wasn't the wonderful, trusted member of the community that they'd assumed she was. Now, three people have claimed that she was exploiting Benny's trust to steal his money, and all are saying that she could be the killer. To make matters worse for her, she's also the only person left that knew about his money stash in the coffee can. Things are getting extremely complex, and the cops have already worked tirelessly for days now. And the problem is, the longer this investigation goes on for, the longer the killer is on the loose, meaning the higher the chances that they might kill again. So now, six days after Benny's murder, detectives bring in Sarah for an interview. It was imperative that they either catch the killer right now or get new information that brings them straight to them. If they don't, then they'll have no suspects, no leads, and a murderer at large. We know that uh, call 911. We got the, the recordings. So we listen to that. Uh, we understand that uh, you would pay his bills. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, tell us about that. Well, that's where we had a dispute. I went to pay his bill. One well, thought I had to pay $40 on it. I needed to borrow that. He said, go ahead. did not remember. I paid him back his $40. That's why I was still, still wrong. That was you brought there. In the interview, similarly to Justin, Sarah doesn't deny the disagreement between them and fully admits that she took some money from him to pay his bills. But again, they seem to make up and become friends again. This time, though, the detectives aren't buying it. Not when so much is on the line. We're hearing two different sides of what we're talking about. We're hearing what you're telling us, but we're hearing from his daughter and what his best friend's telling us. Now, we've been hearing that that he banned you from coming to his house. He didn't want you handling his bills or anything like that. So much that the owner of the store called him and said, hey, she's scamming you. So you're telling us that, that is not true. That's not true. That is not true. I went up there. I didn't go up there until I had the $40 on my hand to pay him. Sarah is saying that all she took from Benny was $40, and she even paid it back. It'd just been blown out of proportion, as she wasn't able to get in contact with Patricia and Johnny to clear her name again. It's suspicious, but the detectives aren't going to get anything more out of her on this front. So they decide to ask her some more background questions. Usually, these don't end up solving the case, but this time, one of their questions provoked an answer that seriously piqued their interest. There's a lady that I was smoking. She had like salt, pepper, hair, long hair. That's not your daughter. Let me ask you this. It's not your daughter that she's not. Oh my daughter. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah that's, that's your true. daughter. She doesn't yeah. live there with you. Do you have any other children? Yeah. Did any of them live with you? Mm -hmm. The audio we received from the police department is censored here, but Sarah tells the cops about her other kid, a boy named Jason, a boy who had just gotten out of prison. Wherever. He's got out of prison. That's my son. When did he get out of prison? That's that number. What was he in jail for? Um, robbery. Oh, shh. Would your son be capable of Oh, God, I pray not. No. I would pray not. According to the detectives, when they asked this question, Sarah tensed up and seemed extremely closed off. Yeah, because I ain't gonna lie. Just her answer right there, I would pray not. That's not a yes or a no. That is a I pray not. So she knows there's a possibility. I pray not. According to the detectives, when they asked this question, Sarah tensed up and seemed extremely closed off. 
She inhales sharply and her whole body jumps when they bring up this possibility. As far as the detectives are concerned, whether intentionally or not, she just told them there is a possibility. That's all they're able to focus on and it all makes sense too. She knew about the coffee can full of money, so what if she'd accidentally mentioned that to Jason? He'd just gotten out of prison for robbery and it'd make complete sense if he saw Benny as an easy target and decided to try and steal his cash. That could even explain the Hummer too. It was a nice car that Jason might have jacked and used to get in and out of the scene quickly. Instantly, the hunt for Jason began, but no matter how hard they tried, they just couldn't track him down. But that's when some new information came to light. Information that would change everything. An inmate of the prison Jason was staying at had contacted police after hearing about the crime, claiming that he knew who the perpetrator was, and promised to reveal it to them in an interview. So I'm told, you told one of the deputies, you got some information about homicide? That's about the old guy that got stabbed. Uh -huh. Yeah, his mother found the body, and then I heard him and his mom arguing over the phone. Bob, he wasn't supposed to go that far. Mm. The mom sent him in to go rob him and he took it way too far. Oh, this is sick. Uh, he wasn't supposed to go that far. Because she always going in the house clean enough when she's been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. and everybody in the neighborhood know they did it, just nobody ain't speaking on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. The inmate said he'd heard Jason and Sarah talking about the murder on the phone after Jason thought he'd hung up. Call? The cops now had no doubt in their minds who their new number one suspect was. And by this point in the investigation, in it's likely call? Jason's cash was starting to run out. They had to find him as soon as possible, before he got the chance to kill again. But, unfortunately, they were already too late. Akron Police and Fire, TNT. Hi. My name is George Bayless. I'm down in Florida now, but my father's still up in Akron. We haven't been able to get a hold of him, and some of his neighbors got a hold of me today, too, and said they haven't seen him since Saturday. They said there were some people over there they didn't really recognize. All right, so we have it, and we're going to get someone over there to check it out, and then um, we can give you a follow-up call. Police quickly initiated a welfare check on George's father, Gary Ballas. When they arrived, they knocked on the front door, and after receiving no response, the officers forced entry through a side door. Gary! Akron Police! Gary, it's Akron Police! Gary! On Thursday, May 21st, Gary Ballas was found dead. It was obvious he'd been dead for a few days, and given the abundance of stab wounds, it was ruled a homicide. An investigation would turn up very little information, except for the fact that Gary's car was missing from the driveway. So Ooh, next, the they started to talk to his neighbors to see if they knew anything about what had happened. Hacker police, just wonder if I could talk to you a couple seconds about your neighbor behind you. Uh -huh. When's the last time you saw him? Police go. Was anybody there with him? Um, he came over here. Oh yeah. Knocked on the door. What did he say? He came over to pick flowers out of the yard. Purple ones. I uh, lilacs. Did Did he have anybody with him when he was there? <laughs> he did came you, over here by himself. Did he have that car days. there Tuesday? I don't remember. I was I was over here. Right. Do you remember? Do you know what kind of car it is? A uh, blue station wagon. Like a Subaru. Yeah. Anybody else live here that might have seen him? Um, my just my kids hey, what's live up? here with me. Have you seen your neighbor Gary. lately? Gary. Yeah. No. Uh, last time I saw him was like three, four days ago. The car was there when she took the flowers over. Or do you remember? The car hasn't been there for over a week. A week. You want to step out here for one second? So Gary, Gary is deceased. It's looking suspicious. That's why I'm asking you these questions. He, he hasn't mentioned anybody. You haven't seen anybody. You haven't heard any fighting. So. All right. 
obviously than maybe it was somebody that's come here before. It's a little odd for Gary's car not to have been at his place for over a week, especially given Gary was still home. There's a chance that this family could be misremembering, but the cops got exactly the same information from each of the other neighbors. Hi, sir. Sorry to bother you so much. Yeah, but... Okay. Um, are you familiar with the um, older gentleman that lives at the Blue House across the street? Yeah, that's Gary. Gary? Yeah, that's her. Yeah. Hey, Jane. Hey, Jane. Hey, Jane. That's Gary. What's, um... He's a, our neighborhood. She used to help him out. She used to babysit his uh, wife. When's the last time you babysit seen Gary? his wife? Uh, what is? A couple days. A couple days? Yeah. Like he was out cutting his grass. Do you remember what day that was? Um, today's what? Like Thursday. Oh, yeah, today's Thursday. Thursday. Probably not on Monday. Monday? Yeah. He's always out cutting his grass. Is he? Oh, he frequents yeah. cutting his grass? Yeah. What, is something that Gary or? Um, you were investigating an incident that occurred over there. Oh, okay. Okay. Huh? The only issue was, not a single one of the neighbors could tell the cops who might be driving that car. Gary did have visitors over somewhat frequently, but they never used his car. If the cops could figure out where the vehicle was and who took it, it seems like they'd have a pretty sure shot at finding the murderer. And that's when they talked to this couple, who claimed they've seen a new guy around his house recently. Excuse me, has anybody been over to talk to you guys yet? No. no. Okay. You know, I called I called the police out here yesterday and they didn't even want to go in there. I don't have so a What did you call them yesterday for? Because I haven't seen him since Saturday and it's not like him to, to leave town and not tell him. You haven't seen him since Saturday? Yeah, nobody answered that door. But you said you guys are positive though. It was, it was Saturday, Saturday he was cutting his grass? Yeah. Have you seen the guy with the cane before? No. Oh, never seen him before. Was he um, white or black? You said he was younger? Yeah. His car wasn't there? No. His car hasn't been there since yeah, Sunday. Okay. But soon the cops were able to put together exactly what had happened. It turns out Gary was never in that car with the other man. When his car pulled out of his driveway for the last time, Gary was already dead, but at least they had a description of who they thought the murderer was. And even better, just a short time after, the cops received word that his car had been seen at a gas station on a surveillance camera. Unfortunately, the camera quality was too poor to properly make out his identity, but at least the cops now know without a shadow of a doubt that if they find that car, they can find the man that killed Gary. But it turns out someone had already done that for them. An unnamed witness came forward and told them that he'd seen that very car and knew precisely who it now belonged to. Jason came over mm. Saturday morning. He was going to help me work on the house I'm working on. Do you know Jason's last name? Shagley or I can't, I don't even know how to okay. pronounce it, something like that. Anyway, he came over, but I had to go to Harbor Freight because I needed a grinder. And so I, I told him, I said, I got to go to Harbor Freight. He said, oh, I'll take you. And I said, wait a minute, Jason. I said, I'm not getting in no hot car. I said, is that car hot? He said, no, the car is not hot. Uncle Willie, no, I wouldn't do you like that. The car is not hot. The car this man is talking about is Gary's Subaru. But more importantly, he just mentioned the name of the man they believe killed Benny, Jason Shockley. This was a shocking breakthrough in both cases. Not only have they essentially just solved Gary's murder, but now they're hot on Jason's tail and have more evidence than ever to try and track him down. Back on the scene, they'd also noticed that Gary's credit cards had been stolen. And this guy's story even lines up perfectly with that, too. He said, my friend let me use it. He went to Florida. He gave me a credit card, told me to keep gas in it, and I can buy cigarettes and buy me something to eat if I need it. I was kind of like not believing him, but he said, no, I swear. It almost seemed too good to be true. So the detectives asked the witnesses to pick Jason out of a photo lineup, and he pointed straight at him instantly. Jason was now the suspect of a double homicide, and two citywide investigations had converged into one. Every single officer and detective in the area knew they couldn't let Jason take another life, so they had to act fast and hunt him down. That's when police received one final phone call, this time from Sarah Evans. Jason's mother. 
On that call, knowing how <coughs> dangerous he could be, she decided to give up her own son and told the police the After address of his safe house. Him? I don't like that. Oh, she, hold on, him. she gave him up after she plotted with him? Nah, bro, nah. And this is your mother. So you put your son up to a crime and then snitch on him. You're the lowest of the low. Oh, yeah, you did the right it's thing, but... Oh, I think you've done so oh, wrong. Which house is it? It's the second one. The one on the right. I wonder he's the way he is. Is there a way to go back to the... Hello. Hello. What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? The house was abandoned, boarded up, and dirty. It was unclear if anyone was even inside, but the cops have to be extremely vigilant as they know Jason could be armed. After clearing the first floor, they moved upstairs as a group and tried to figure out where Jason was hiding. Yes, he's in there, he's hearing all these walkie talkies and footsteps. I think it's excellent in there. door on this floor was fully closed and every other room was empty this is where they think jason is problem is they've already made a lot of noise so whoever's on the other side of that door could be prepared that's why they decide to storm in Roll out your stomach, hands are behind your back. Let's go. Sir, sir. Hurry up, Jason. Look how he's living, man. Look at that knife. Anybody else in the house? No, sir. Is that everything illegal on you, man? Besides the knife? Yeah. Stand up. Put them in a cruiser. You got shoes, bud? Yes, sir. Where's your shoes at? Right underneath the blanket right there. You want a paddle? Shake them? Yeah. I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it. I'm going to check it up there. Just as they'd hoped, Jason was found lying amongst rubble and trash on the second floor, attempting to hide away from the very people who just put him in cuffs. Thankfully, he put up no resistance, and a quick sweep of the house confirmed he was the only person here. Amongst the trash on the floor, the officers found multiple knives and a credit card belonging to Gary Ballas. After six weeks of investigations, they'd finally caught him. He was then taken out of the house and into the back of a patrol car. But there was still one problem with all of this. 
they still had no evidence that he was the one who killed Benny all those weeks ago. Sure, the connection is strange and multiple people have accused him, but there's nothing solid. That's what the cops wanted to change in the interrogation room and bring peace to Benny's family almost two months after his death. Remember, Jason is likely not aware of exactly how much the cops know. All he knows is that he was arrested and now the cops are interrogating him. He might even think that they don't know about the murders and that he could get away with everything. How do you know Gary Bayless? I knew the bad Gary, like I said, my cousin lived next door, but my mom used to go over and help him out a lot. He gets, he gets to telling me about how he hates uh, I don't trust him everything. Yeah, he's a birdie supporter. <laughs> Man. Yeah. Hey, he, he's out there. He, he's a trip. Yeah. I asked him, you know, if there'd be a possibility. Don't tell me this gets into political. Don't tell me this gets to political. Please don't tell me this gets political and some racist stuff, man. He's a trip. Yeah. I asked him, you know, if there'd be a possibility if he can lend me his car so I can slide it in to work and stuff. Okay. You know, he's iffy on it for a second, you know what I mean? Because he doesn't like people using his car and stuff. Right. He was like, I'm a big guy, but he was like, I want to see you, I want to see you succeed. He said, I want to see you do like. You know, you know that I just got out of prison. For, for so how long have you had this car for? I had, I've had this car for a few days. How long have you known the car? I've known Gary for almost nine years. Oh, wow. So you've yeah. had a long relationship. I've stayed a night or two at his house before. So you've been in the house before? And stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everything up until this point is mostly the truth. He did know Gary and he had spent some time with him recently. But remember, he was found with Gary's stolen credit cards in his stolen car just days after he was murdered. This is shaping up to be a textbook interrogation where the detectives will have to catch him out in various lies in order to extract the truth. And they're about to start that process immediately. Jason, tell me what happened now. Um, what do you mean, tell you what happened? I have people that are that are in the area that see you and him together. He's been deceased since about the same time you see him. You've got his card and his credit cards. You tell me what happened. I told you. He lends me his card for work. Why is his neighbors and his son and everybody else saying that he will not lend his card to anyone? Everybody has told me that. And then that, that's where they're photographed. Look, all that did was knock on the outer door. Mm -hmm. You can smell it from the sidewalk. He's claiming that Gary had lent him his car for work and had used the credit cards he'd left in his car to just buy a few cigarettes. But clearly the cops don't believe him. In fact, this entire questioning segment about Gary is more of a formality. They have much more yeah, evidence about this crime out, than they huh? do Benny's. So their plan is to try and have him confess to Gary's murder so that confessing to Benny's doesn't seem like such a big deal. It seems like a clever strategy, but it won't work if Jason simply refuses to admit to anything. Wouldn't you agree to us that, or agree with us that it's kind of weird that you're the last person that they've yes. seen with him? Yes, you know, I dead. find that weird. I, find, you know, I see where you guys stand with him. But at the same time, I'm not no dude. That's not, you know, do, man. Well, sometimes people don't no. go in, and sometimes people no. get in an argument. No, people no, go no, no, far. no. Anybody that knows me will tell you. That's not what I do. So what? I smoke some crack. I've been smoking since I was 11 years old. Damn. But, you know what? I do some stupid shit like that. I've smoked crack home. since 11? If you were a jury and you heard your story about a man who loaned you his car, who has been known not to loan his car to anybody. His family says, his neighbor says so, because if you don't help yourself, this can end up really bad for you. When confronted with the cold, hard facts, something changes about Jason. He loses his confidence, he's fidgeting with his hands to try and distract himself, he avoids making eye contact with the detective however he can, whether it be looking down at the table, up at the ceiling, or even at the wall next to him. 
he almost looks ashamed. And that's no illusion. Pay close attention to what he does next, as it marks the beginning of a startling confession. Even if you did wrong, and the judge, and, and you admit to what happened and everything else, the judge takes that into consideration, because it shows remorse. You want me to turn it off? Stop. You raised it first. I'm not erasing anything. You raised it first, boy. I'm not erasing anything. No evidence. I can't do both. You raised it. I'm saying. You want the first one? I'm going to tell you what you can do. There. It's completely off. Jason thinks that that audio recorder is the only thing recording what he's saying right now. Somehow he doesn't realize the camera in the corner also has a microphone built in. So now that the audio recorder is off, he thinks he's free to say whatever he wants. He's over there drinking a lot of stuff, just talking bullshit. I guess my mom borrowed $20 from him. You know, he was telling me about it and stuff, and then he had to be in, you know, get over it and stuff. I'm very protective Okay. I'm not all of it. He kept me from talking real crazy about my life. I asked him very few stuff. So, I'm like, you know what, I gotta go. I get up to leave. And he throws his cup at me. And it had wine and he threw it at me. Picked up his knife. I pushed him down. He dropped the knife. I took the knife. I'm going to push my hand. Back into his chair. He said, I'll oh, shoot you. And when he went to reach, I was like, I should go. Damn. It was a textbook confession, and the cops did an incredible job at helping him through it and making him feel comfortable. The thing is, they know this still isn't the whole truth, but it's all they need for now. They could disprove his self-defense story later in court. What matters is that he admitted to it in some respect. Now they can switch gears to Benny's murder, Wait. but he's not going to make... So Gary knew his mom too? his mom borrowed money from Gary. Whole time I thought he was talking about him. Bring that back one more time. He kept me talking real crazy about my life. I asked him like very few stuff. So, I'm like, you know what, I gotta go. I get up to leave. And he throws his cup at me. And he and had wine and then he threw it at me. Picked up his knife. I pushed him down. He dropped the knife. I took the knife. I'm going to push my hand back into his chair. He said, I'll shoot you. And when he went to reach, I was like, I should not go. I should not go. It was a textbook confession, and the cops did an incredible job at helping him through it and making him feel comfortable. The thing is, they know this still isn't the whole truth, but it's all they need for now. They could disprove his self-defense story later in court. What matters is that he admitted to it in some respect. Now they can switch gears to Benny's murder, but he's not going to make that one as easy. You probably are going to prove that, that, that you did Benny. No, and, I didn't and, do and, Benny. And you're definitely going to be looking at a capital case. And I'll be looking at a capital case as an innocent man for somebody out here, too. You, you told us about Gary. It's like Detective Kennedy said, the two cases are like a mirror. No, you're, you're lying about the cases being similar. Despite just being finessed into admitting to murder, Jason suddenly thinks he's the smartest person in the room. The cases are almost an exact mirror of each other, but Jason thinks he can escape liability for at least one of them. But he's dead wrong. See, here's another thing. You just told us that you went through Gary's pants. You went through Benny's pants, too. Because you know, because Benny was known to carry several hundred dollars in his pants pocket. That I did. I mean, everybody did. No, everybody did. Everybody knew. I did it. So Benny never so, pulled money out and planned. I, I didn't say that. Most moms 
her like there's no way my kid would do that. No, she 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 knows for a fact that I didn't do that. that I'm not that. saying about Benny. I'm just saying your mom's Break sitting here thinking you know, it's impossible. You know, it's impossible. But we talked to her about it. Just did. Yeah, we talked about. It. She's freaking out. So, and as far as me asking her if I thought you did it, it was now hell no. It was oh my god, I hope not. Jason, do you see what you're Listen to me, okay? I done told you about being here, you know. But this shit about baby was not me. And despite all the pressure the cops put on him, this is the story he stuck to. It seemed he thought he could maybe convince a jury of one self-defense charge, but two was simply too suspicious. But that didn't matter, as the cops figured they still knew exactly what happened. Jason knew Benny through his mother and had heard about the coffee can of cash. He broke in one morning in an attempt to steal the cash, accidentally waking Benny in the process. They started fighting, and Jason, fearing he'd call the police, stabbed him multiple times. Eventually, Benny crawled out to the hallway where he bled out. They also started to discount his story about Gary's murder. They believed that it wasn't any form of self-defense, and in reality, it was simply a disagreement. Jason had gotten irrationally angry after Gary refused to let him use his car. In his rage, he shoved him to the ground and killed him in the same manner, before stealing his credit cards and leaving in his car. These are the theories that the prosecution presented to the jury, and, as expected, they believed them. Only one person was charged in the murders of Benny King and Gary Ballas. Justin, Johnny, and Sarah were all ruled innocent. But Jason wasn't so lucky. In 2022, he was convicted of both of the murders and sentenced to life in prison. Bro, I don't know how they didn't charge his mom with the murder when she knew. We have someone saying that she said he took it too far. And she lied to y'all. She let y'all go. Like, isn't that conspiracy? Am I tweaking? Nah, bro. This thing is wicked. Yo, let me know what y'all think about this in the comments, man. Make sure y'all smash that like button. Smash that subscribe button. It's your boy swagging them out, you heard?